Well, good morning, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. As you can see behind us is the original Lansky where Elvis Presley got his first suit. And today we are gonna explore a little bit of Beale Street. We are going to hit a popular museum here, and I know you guys will love it. If you love rock and soul and all the music that came out of Memphis, you're gonna love this place. Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. You can definitely tell we have made it to historic Beale Street. I love it. And right across the street you can see BB King's. Talk about great people who made their name here in Memphis and on Beale Street, BB King is definitely one you gotta mention. There's the Hard Rock. Now we're not gonna explore all of Beale Street right now. We're going to the Rock and Soul Museum. But we'll definitely explore a lot of it in future vlogs. For sure. The reason I say we'll come back is because I want to check it out at night. I do love as we're working our way down the street to get to the Rock and Soul Museum. They have all these nice golden notes and this one says Albert King, Mr. Blues. And then you got over here George Hunt, Sly Guitar Man, Walter Fury Lewis. Hard to not want to stop and take a look at some of these things but... I think we're going to come have some lunch here after the museum. Now even though I know there's a lot of really great music museums, I hit a couple of them last time I was in Memphis and I wanted to hit this one today because I saw that the Smithsonian has a hand in this and I figured they might have some really cool stuff to check out. It's actually located right here beside where the Memphis Grizzlies play. Right there. So right here you can tell why they put it here. This is the Memphis Blues Trail. From Mississippi to Memphis, the bright lights of Beale Street and the promise Musical stardom have lured blues musicians from nearby Mississippi since the early 1900s. Early Memphis blues luminaries who migrated from Mississippi include Gus Cannon, Fury Lewis, Jim Jackson, and Memphis Minnie. In the post-World War II era, many native Mississippians became blues, soul, and rock and roll recording stars in Memphis, including Rufus Thomas, Junior Parker, B.B. King, and Elvis Presley. So let's go check it out. They're winning me over as soon as I walk in because I see that's all right. As the 45 for Sun Records, Elvis Presley right on the ceiling. You recognize some mop tops in there. I see Ringo, Paul, and John across the top and then George right there in the center. Oh, that's so cool. Take a look at that. Isaac Hayes Road case. All right, so they basically start the story here of Memphis music, kind of showing that it was a working class community and uh, a lot of people that were working out in the fields would listen to the radio and create their own music basically out of necessity. Even B.B. King would say he worked out in the fields and would race to get done so he could get home and listen to Sonny Boy Williamson on the radio. And there's some early instruments. The washboard. Now let's go on into the museum. This is gonna be great. I can't wait. First off, they're showing what Southern life was like for people like Elvis and Johnny Cash, Carl Perkins. And that's on the, maybe the brighter side of things. People like B.B. King and some of the blues guys had a much tougher life even. This is showing that many families would all live in one room and the only entertainment they would really have would be they would have, if they were lucky, a Victrola to, uh, to play amongst the family. So they have a Victrola here on display. Actually this is technically a hand crank record player. Then right here they're talking about Robert Johnson and how Robert Johnson was living in Memphis for a couple of years and then disappeared to the Delta for a year. Nobody saw him and when he came back he was an amazing blues man probably heard the story of the crossroads and this is Jimmy Rogers another one that ran off to pursue his musical ambitions here ran off with a medicine show actually <laughs> did odd jobs and then was diagnosed with tuberculosis and this is great this is Minnie Pearl's dress I'm just so proud to be here. 
course, this is representing the Grand Ole Opry. Because in 1925, the Grand Ole Opry started its radio broadcast in Nashville and quickly became the most important hour in many people's weekly routine. And this says this is a dulcimer given to Elvis Presley from June Carter Cash in 1974. And this big giant piece of machinery says was an original piece of the Grand Old Opry transmitter. They used to shoot out that radio program from WSM Radio with that guy. Then this is showing the segregation that even though musicians were equal as far as music goes they weren't as people Stax records was one of the big ones that helped change that you can see the different doors here's an original poster from club ebony and you can see fats domino the clovers ruth brown little richard this would have been really early days So this case is for Rudy Williams and it says that he was heralded as the mayor of Beale Street. He spent 50 years performing as a downtown Memphis blues fixture until his death at the age of 70 in 2011. He used to serenade tourists almost every day in front of Beale's King Palace. And it said that while alive, Rudy Williams led all Beale Street funeral processions until his own. And then here they're kind of chronicling the history of the jug bands, showing them with the hold made instruments. And here's one right here. You can see it's basically a broom or a shovel stick with a string tied on to a bucket that would have acted as somewhat of a base. Then of course W.C. Handy and the blues. You can see here they've got an original microphone here. It says on loan from WDIA, the Goodwill Station. And there we got B.B. King. baseball jersey from WDIA. Here you can see pretty prominent station here in town. I never actually heard of this guy but his name was Sputnik Monroe and they said that he was one of the most popular wrestlers to come out of Memphis. In the 1950s they said he would dress in Lansky clothes, same ones that we know Elvis was buying and he would part his hair, look you can actually see part of his hair is black on the sides and then the stripe down the middle is blonde. He said he particularly appealed to African Americans. He said that he once had an issue where um, he was heckled um, because he had put his arm around a black man. How about that? Then they actually have his uh, ring attire in here, what he would have wore. He wore a lot of fancy clothes, drew a lot of attention. And look at those old worn out boots, wrestling boots. And he even had a little restaurant here. He said you could often see him strutting down Beale Street. And here we have something from the radio station WHBQ. And if it sounds familiar in Elvis lore, that's because Dewey Phillips was there. Dewey was one of the first people to really champion Elvis's music. He was a big proponent of rhythm and blues. Said he would have an estimated 100,000 people tune in when he did his radio shows. 
And here's an old True Tone radio. And here's a portable reel-to-reel -reel recording machine. That's kind of how Stack started. He basically had one of these kind of things that he could take various places and then eventually started his own studio in a garage. Here's a little promotional radio toy. Then of course the invention of the jukebox, which you don't really think about, but I hadn't thought of it until someone mentioned it the other day. They said, well, that was just a way of not paying musicians in bars and clubs anymore. They were replaced by these. So now we're gonna enter a little bit of sun history. And of course the genius behind it, Sam Phillips. And Sam pretty much started out small time too. You can see a Memphis recording service, that was his. And then here's some of the recording equipment. And there's Sam Phillips on the right. All right, now we're getting to the good stuff. Look at all this. The Elvis, Johnny Cash, all that. Let's take a look. Looks like Elvis's yearbook. I can see a lot of signatures and everything in there. And there's Elvis. Right up there. Looks like he even inscribed it. You can see off to the right his signature. Right, right there. These are the original lyrics for Heartbreak Hotel. I'll check out some of his wardrobe. You've got some military attire, some of his personal stuff, even a guitar down here that was once owned by Elvis. A company called Tassano. And that guitar sure looks an awful lot like the guitar in this photo. Wouldn't you say? I think it's the same one. Now we're going over here. I see some Billy Lee Riley stuff, some Sun Records. Let's see what we got here. We got a guitar, silver tone guitar. And then this is a suit worn by Jerry Lee Lewis right there. Kind of tricky to get it without the glare but I'm trying that's all Billy Lee Riley's harmonicas and then it looks like these were costumes worn by the great Johnny Cash the man in black as you can tell nice detail on it and that little 45 next to his wardrobe is his the way of a woman in love What a great museum. Now that guitar is a GNL, and that was actually made by Leo Fender, the man that started Fender, and that was made and given to Carl Perkins. It even has a Carl Perkins guitar pick still jammed in the pick guard up there. Let's see if we can't zoom in on that. See how good this camera really is. And that's also Carl Perkins' shirt, and the microphone it says is Carl Perkins' blue suede shoes microphone. To quote Carl, it never was much of a mic, but it is the first one blue suede shoes was sung into in 1955. Well, we'll take it, Carl. We'll take it. And that good looking guy is Roy Orbison. And they actually have his 45, his Ubi Doobie 45, because he got started there at Sun Records as well. Then you can see there's a microphone in here in case you want to pretend that you're a recording artist in the studio. You're on the other side of the equipment from Sun that we looked at a little bit ago. Or from Memphis recording. It's just perfect for selfies. Now they're showing the effect Elvis had on popular culture and merchandising because this is all Elvis stuff. This is all, you know, record players and girls skirts and there's the music sheet music and Elvis guitars little makeup kits oh this is really cool popular tunes that's where Elvis used to buy his music see there he is we're actually gonna go there before the end of this trip the end of this road trip.
Ike Turner has been heavily vilified for the What's Love Got To Do With It movie that was not entirely accurate. Tina Turner has even said that, but you can't negate his musical contribution. He was a major hit star. He actually was hired by Sam Phillips to go find musicians to record, people that no one else would know about. And also, he was on Rocket 88, which was a huge hit. Huge, huge. And he also discovered Tina Turner, of course. This was his very first piano, it says. Kind of interesting. It says, Willie, Joe Willie Pine Top Perkins taught Ike Turner to play piano. Turner used this piano to perfect his style that was used on Rocket 88. The piano was used on some early recordings with Jackie Brenston, Howlin' Wolf, and others, while Turner was a field representative for a modern recording company which was Sam Phillips. And then up there all the way to the right, you can see Tina Turner. And then of course the great B.B. King, King of the Blues. There you have an autograph, Lucille, one of his models. You can see there's a gold signature up there. And then this is what he used to play early on. That was the original. And if you look down in there, it says custom made. He would have put that on there. And there's a lot of wear to that, you can see. On all the hardware and everything. All right, let's move on. Music and social change. Let's see what we got in here. This is all representing stacks. Estelle Axton's clothes. And I did vlog the Stax Museum already. Go look it up on my channel. It was really fun. And then I talked about Isaac Hayes the other day. Oh yeah, that's Isaac Hayes jacket right there. Some eight tracks. Isaac Hayes piano when he used to play for Stax. And that bass was Donald Duck Dunn who was the session bassist for Stax, or the studio bassist. He was also in the Blues Brothers. And then, stage costume of Carla Thomas, who David Porter and Isaac Hayes wrote some hit songs for. And of course, Otis Redding was part of Stax. Can't forget him. Look at that. Whew. Nice. Then we have some really great wardrobe here. Ann Peebles is this blue one. Man, what great designs. Wow, that's incredible. And then Willie Mitchell's suit. Then Willie Mitchell kind of graduated on to things like this. And then this vest is Ace Cannon's vest. And then that's Al Green's shirt and pants. Let's stay together. And then this is Al Green's gospel robe. If you can see that big long black robe and his Bible, his holy Bible in there. And that was Jerry Lee Lewis, kind of a nudie suit. All the way down the legs too, I love it. And then all that jewelry belonged to Charlie Rich. Look at that, man, look at that necklace, I'd wear that. The necklace and the belt are just incredible. Check that guy out. And then check that out. All right, let's move on. Wow. I think you can take a guess who would have worn this jumpsuit. Yeah, definitely an Elvis. Both of them. Now this is really cool. This says that this was the Hammond organ and Fender Jazzmaster guitar used to compose Suspicious Minds. So 
there's the organ. Ba-doom, doo-doom. Then there are the handwritten lyrics. You can see up there in pencil. Kind of faded, but it's there. And then there's the guitar. <laughs> that is rad. Now this Triumph motorcycle was owned by Sam the Sham, and these were his clothes also. And then here he is. I'm not actually familiar with his music. Kind of interested to hear it now though. There's the motorcycle he's riding. It's the one we just saw. Here's an old school Rockola jukebox. God bless him, they even mentioned Big Star. Alex Chilton, Big Star. I love Big Star. Because of course, Alex Chilton came from the box tops. And of course, social unrest because Dr. King was killed in this city. Nobody can ever accuse Isaac Hayes of not popping out in a crowd. <laughs> Chain vest and all. And look at this. He would have worn this live. Oh, this is really cool. This is the mixing board from Ardent Studios, and Ardent is who released Big Star. Oh, wow. So, the original tracks for 13, and September Girls, and all those would have been in here. Don't Lie to Me, all those. Wow, that's freaking rad. That's really cool to me. I love that record. If you want to try out some Big Star, get number one record or just Big Star, self-titled. Now we're at the end and this is really cool. These are gigantic guitar picks all signed by famous people and then in between on the paper other people have signed it or maybe the same person who signed the pick sometimes. So you can see here it says Anna Nancy from Heart, Ozzy Osbourne and Jack Osbourne. This one is Meatloaf, Keep Rockin'. Joe Cocker, and B.B. King. All right, I know we said we were gonna have lunch over at the Rum Boogie, but I asked somebody inside, actually, actually two people that live here, if I should go there, and they said, get a drink and go, don't eat there. They actually told me somewhere else to eat, but they said they didn't think it was open today. It was right what we saw at the very beginning of the video, Blue City. So we'll go look around, see if we can find something to eat, and uh, probably call it a day. That place was amazing. If you're a music lover like me, do not sleep on the Rock and Soul Museum. Totally worth it. I don't know what's going on inside there, but beware of Irish diving goats. I'll keep my eyes peeled, thanks. Too bad this isn't open, I'd go there. Jerry the King Lawler's Hall of Fame Bar? I don't care what they serve, I'd try it. Barbecue ribs, I'd try it. So that's where I was told to eat, but they said that they didn't think it was open till the evenings, if that, right now. So we'll do BB Kings. Let's give it a try. There's the stage. I love the table that they gave me. And there's some BB King art up there on the walls. And I'm looking right at the stage. Well, shrimp and grits don't look too bad. I might try that. We'll look at the rest of the menu first. I don't know, the King's Meatloaf looks pretty good too. I love it. Every last one of these tables has someone painted on it. Otis is faintly playing as I'm waiting for my food. I believe it. So I went ahead and opted for the meatloaf. How good does that look? Mashed potatoes, some vegetables, so good. Looks like they even wrap it in bacon. Wowza. I'm one bite of the meatloaf, one mashed potato, and one vegetables in. And it's one of the best meals I've ever had in my life. I am not kidding. That is one of the best meatloafs I've ever had. I can't recommend this enough. This was amazing. This food was freaking amazing. Good job, baby king. Oh man, that food was absolutely fantastic. I definitely put some south in my mouth. 
All right, thank you everyone for watching. Thank you Penny Bullen for becoming my newest Patreon. We'll see you all tomorrow. Have a great night and goodbye.